to some cat called Booker like that, okay. you know? And uh, he can play some piano. I can remember a few times seeing him perform, mostly at the Maple Leaf when he was on. Uh, Booker had one of his left hand bass figures going where he's playing a, a stride bass pattern along with this very complicated syncopated chord pattern all with the same hand. And you just got this feeling of this was about as much ecstasy on earth as you could squeeze out of a piano. I don't know what he was feeling like when he was playing something like that, but he he would leave people in the audience silent, just astonished at what they were hearing. Because this man was a genius, I, I kid you not, and it was, to me, it was very apparent. But if you ever had the occasion to sit down face to face with a guy and really understand him, it was very apparent that the man was a genius. You know, he really was, was phenomenal. And then right after the show, he walked up to me and he said, uh, he asked me if I was the son of the current CIA director, actually. He was the Black Liberace, okay? Of course, the Piano Prince of New Orleans, the Orleanian Earthquake, the Bayou Maharaja, the, the Piano Pope of New Orleans. He had quite a few names that he called himself. James Carroll Booker III, born December 17, 1939 in New Orleans, died November 8, 1983, Charity Hospital, New Orleans. In between, James Booker came from being a child prodigy, to session pianist, to the most talented pianist in New Orleans, and possibly the universe. When he lived, his prowess on the keys was shadowed by drug addictions, a nomad lifestyle, erratic behavior, and jail terms. Tales abound of crazy things he did, as well as his kindness and tenderness toward his friends. In the next hour, and in part two, you will hear the story of James Booker from those who knew him, his friends, fellow musicians, family, and fans. Much of the story is contained in his music, and there will be plenty of that that will simply amaze you. So sit up and listen closely, because in the whole history of American music, there has been no one like the Black Chopin, the Bronze Liberace, the Bayou Maharaja, Little Booker, the Piano Prince of New Orleans, James Carroll Booker III. James Carroll Booker III was born in Charity Hospital in New Orleans on December 17, 1939, to James Carroll Booker II and Aura Champagne Booker. It was the Booker's second child. James had an older sister named Betty Jean Booker. James's childhood friend, pianist Ed Frank, and his cousin Dorothy Cheatham explained his early life. His father was a minister, his mother was a hairdresser, and uh, his sister was very nice. She was young you know, and in school. They were all nice too. I said my papa was a preacher. He, was a he started in, in um, New Orleans on Pennison Street with his mother. He was with his mother and father. And from there, as he got gotten older, he uh, lived in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, with his uncle. Yeah, yeah, you know my papa was a Joel Neville. I asked him when did he start playing the piano, and he told me he was playing the piano in the uh, in the baby bed. <laughs> he said he reached over in the crib and hit a few notes while he was while he was in the bed.
Booker's niece, Sheila Twix. His father got sick. That's what prompted uh, my grandmother to ask her sister to let them come and stay with her a while. And of course they had to get in school, you know, and this was until his father was to get better. James stayed in Bay St. Louis with his Aunt Bessie Lozana until he was in fourth grade. In interviews later, James said he liked Bay St. Louis. It was there he took his first piano lessons from a nun at his school. She at the time was teaching James's sister, Betty Jean. And the music teacher back then, whose name was Miss Matt, I remember them saying, said, well, just let me see how he does. And if he does okay, we'll go ahead and let him take lessons too. So he couldn't have been, I doubt if he was even uh, seven or eight, he had to have been, you know, relatively young, because usually a music teacher won't start you until you can at least read. So he had to have been just at that age where he had just started learning to read, or, you know, maybe he didn't even know, you know, pretty much the alphabet or whatever. In 1947, Booker moved back to New Orleans with his parents. Art and Charles Neville recall him then. Well, Jan Book and I went to grammar school, St. Monica School. We were going to attend the same school. Nuns of the Blessed Sacrament taught us. He played for the for the church, and I didn't realize how serious that was then until later on. And if we, you know, after we were grown, that was very serious for a young person to be playing. This was like in maybe this fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, that's when I really, really, he was playing for the mass. Oh, he was a lot of fun to be around. He was a normal, normal kid, you know, other than the fact that he was a genius on the piano at, at a young age. He was good at everything he did musically. Saxophone was another one of the instruments that he did very well. Charles Neville. Oh, uh, yeah, he was playing classical. He always played classical. Uh, he was playing classical when he was a little kid. I remember back in, in at St. Monica when we were going to, I think he, we, we were in the third grade, and he was hit by an ambulance back then. That's when you had them Ghostbuster ambulance, and big thing with the big stick chrome bumpers, the great big. And he was he almost died. I mean, we, I remember the whole class was praying for him every day, and uh, he he got he came out came through it. He had a lot of hard times during his life. Bunny Matthews. New Orleans journalist and cartoonist agrees. The the childhood things I know about are the uh, ambulance accident that you know ambulance hit him going 70 miles an hour and drug him down the street and his mother was a cosmetologist I believe and she ran outside and James was there and ended up right in front of her and they took him to the hospital and that's where he says he got his first taste of euphoria you know because they gave him morphine but the family also did some get some big insurance settlement for this money so that kept them relatively uh, middle class, you know, for black family in New Orleans. And... Booker then moved back to Bay St. Louis after the accident. He spent much time traveling back and forth between there and New Orleans. Finally, he moved back to New Orleans to stay in 1953 after the death of his father. 
He started his freshman year of high school at Xavier Prep on Magazine Street in Uptown New Orleans. Joel Neville was his classmate there. I met him when I was a freshman in high school. He was, uh, he was my classmate from uh, ninth grade all the way through 12th grade. The first year we took Latin together. The first two years. The last two years we took Spanish together, Spanish one and two. He was, uh, he was a smart student and uh, he did his work. Well, we had to do work at the school where we went, you know, because we had nuns, and the nuns were kind of strict, so we couldn't have all that craziness going on. But he was a, uh, he was a clown in class when the teachers turned their back. Like one time I remember the, uh, a certain nun asking in geography where was like a, a, a certain country located. And you're supposed to say like northeast or northwest. So he grabs the book and go up and show the teacher. This is where it's located right here. <laughs> and point at it in the book. That's the kind of foolishness. Oh yeah. He was the best pianist I had ever heard. Malaguania. And uh that was his theme song, right? But he also played all the concertos, all the uh, sonatas. He played everything that the senior students were playing who were graduating from music school and these people were going on to college. He was, in fact, that's what he ended up playing with. They like put him with the senior students because he was just that good. Pianist, producer, and composer, Alan Tucson. The radio station in town called WMRY on Dryad Street. And there was a piano. In fact, radio stations in those days used to have pianos because uh, they'd have uh, live performances from time to time. And anywhere there was a piano nearby, Booker, uh, as myself, used to go by and play because we came from... Uh, backgrounds where our pianos were most humble and usually terribly out of tune, those old uprights. But places like radio stations would have something a bit more modern, and there was a spinet piano there, and I used to go by this place sometimes to play that piano, and one day when I went by, Booker was there. And that was the first time I had uh, met Booker. I had heard about him, because kids hear about each other uh, that's in the same uh, scheme of things that they are. But uh, I, he had a cast on his arm and he had, it was all the way down to the middle of his hand and just his fingers were sticking out of, of, uh, out of the arm that had the cast on it. And he was playing so much piano. I mean, even if there was no cast or anything, for a boy to be playing that much was just outrageous. He was already playing Bach and Rachmaninoff, things like that, and some funk too. The gig on the radio led to Booker's first session with New Orleans' best-known producer in 1954. Pianist Ed Frank explains. We did the record Hambone with Dave Bartholomew. Uh, well, he had some problems with his recording techniques and uh, playing with the band, you know, keeping the tempo and stuff like that. But he was a fantastic piano player. Trumpeter and producer David Bartholomew. So I tried him on a couple of records, and uh, and I think the first thing was something like a little hand jive type thing that we did it was hand bones. So I said, let's do that. And uh, it, it was the thing they were doing on TV, and I said, this just might catch on if we put it on records. Well, it didn't actually happen, but it actually got his name out. When he was about 12, he was on television. 
guitarist and songwriter <laughs> Earl King. Booker was on television at 12, singing a song called Hambone, Hambone, Where You Been, all that stuff. The Hambone single, with its flip side of Thinking About My Baby, failed to sell many copies. Another single, You Need Me and Heavenly Angel, recorded for chess, also failed to sell. Booker remained in high school until he graduated in 1957. Upon graduation, Booker started traveling first with rhythm and blues singer Joe Tex, and then Shirley and Lee and Huey P. Smith and the Clowns. Pianist Reggie Hall went out with Booker in those bands. I was on tour with Booker with Sheryl and Lee. Yeah, we both was playing piano. When Sheryl and come up and Sheryl and Lee come up. In other words, Booker was opening, was opening, and then when Sheryl and Lee come up, I did I would play behind Sheryl and Lee because I, you know, Booker could play behind him too, just as well. But um, at that time, we was doing like them uh, one nighters around Alabama and all that kind of stuff, you know, through there. Doing them one nighters out there. Mostly we was playing um, like some of the most of the, some of the halls, the some lounges. He had them long rides in them station wagons and stuff like that. How does the devil we packed in the station wagon and packed in every instruments and all that stuff. Stay in them, stay in the hotels, but it's the as you know as then during that time it was the low rate hotels and it's the only place we had to stay. Johnny Vincent, producer of Huey P. Smith and the Clowns for Ace Records, worked with Booker in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, I mean, he went out under the name of Huey. In other words, if we, if Huey was booked in, in Pittsburgh and, and Huey didn't want to go, he let Booker go as Huey. Huey was all the way of the, the piano player. So Booker knew how to play just like Huey, so he didn't need to go out. He let Booker go out because he didn't like to travel. Now's the time for station identification. At this point, Booker is also spending time at the famous New Orleans nightclub, the Dew Drop Inn. The who's who from everywhere had to go through the Dew Drop. Even from far, like if artists came through town, if Blue Richard came through town, he had to go through the Dew Drop, at least show up. Everyone, Duke Ellington, everyone. And of course they had shows, so there was always entertainment going on and it was a place for jam sessions. All uh, musicians, uh, used to sit in and jam 
or whatever they play it. Guitarist Deacon John. The Dewdrop was the premier black nightclub for entertainment. Because it was the only black club in town you could go to where it was a floor show. You had a comedian, some guy who maybe would come on with a marionette and might have a, an exotic dancer and follow that up with an instrumentalist, an outstanding instrumentalist, a vocalist. And then it was the female impersonators like Patsy Valdez. Patsy was usually the MC in residence. And uh, Patsy would MC most of all the shows and do the opening number and come out with a ball gown with a long cigarette holder and say, good evening, darlings, with a big hat on. And, and he said, drink hard and stick with your party. And this show is coming on right away. Right now we have uh, Lil Booker's gonna entertain you, Mr. Gonzo, and everybody with, hey, here comes Booker. <laughs> He'd do his thing. He'd play beautiful piano. He's such a little guy, you know, they call him Lil Booker. He could play Mozart and Bach and Beethoven and all that in very early age. And it's just astounding when people see such a little guy play that much piano, you know, just like he was just born with. As well as playing at the Dewdrop, Booker played on recording sessions with Little Richard and Fats Domino at JM Studios in New Orleans. Cosimo Matassa, owner and chief engineer of JM, explains. I guess the first things he did, he probably played on other people's recordings, you know, little pickup bands and stuff like that. There, there was an inordinate amount of, of just putting bands together kind of thing, depending on who somebody was recording, and they'd, they'd bring two or three of their friends and you'd fill in whoever was available for the other things. A lot of times you could just go outside and, I need a piano player and a tenor sax, you know, and that kind of thing, and, and whoever was there would, would, could, could come in. Oh, we had a list of everybody's phone numbers, usually not their home numbers, but where they hung out. Uh, but he, his, his piano playing is in uh, at least one Fats Domino session and, and, and pro probably one of or more, most of the other guys we recorded. Uh, it, was, it was a case of either what was being done was something that he was particularly uh, the right person for, or whoever was supposed to be didn't come, it was, you know, drunk, missing, or in jail. By 1959, James Booker had taken a break from traveling and entered college at Southern University of New Orleans. Charles Neville was his fellow student at the time. Well, by the time we were in college, we were very worldly experienced. When we were in college, Booker played everything and anything. He could play the blues. He was a great, great jazz player. He was a great classical player. Um, he could do anything. He was a really good student as well, yeah. Yeah, he was very, very smart. Earl King. When he was going out there to Sumo, wherever he was going out there, the one of the instructors walked up to the other and said, Earl, you friends of Booker, tell him don't disrupt my class. I'll grade him, stay his butt out of my class. I can't teach him no music. Who gonna teach Booker some music? That's a waste of my time. Booker stayed in school for about a year and a half before he took a gig playing organ for D. Clark and Phil Upchurch. Ed Frank tells how this led to Booker staying in Houston and recording his highest charting single, Gonzo and Cool Turkey, for Don Roby's Duke Records in 1960. I was working down in Houston, and he came to Houston with D. Clark, and the band broke up in Houston. He lived out there where I was living for a while. And like I said, he made uh, quite a few sessions as a pianist to make a living, you know, and he played some gigs around Houston. He, was, he started off working his way home, and then he, uh, got a little interested in what was going on, and he decided he wanted to do something himself. And Mr. Roby was interested in him, so we did something. Gonzo. And it sold about 100, 200,000 records, you know. But he came up with the name. He got it from a movie. 
I think Gonzo was a dope pusher or something, something like that. intelligent little man, you know, like he was uh, impulsive, you know, he might decide he wanted to do something and just get up and go do it, you know. And sometimes he'd be up five, well not five, six or seven o'clock in the morning playing the piano, you know. i tell you what happened, he was playing the organ in the studio one day and he was playing so nice one of the secretaries came over to listen to him. And she said, oh, I wish I could do that. So he told her to sit down and practice. And he would go over and do her work for her. And she laughed. And he went over to her desk and sat down and started to type her work up. Turned out he was a very fluent typist. Despite the obvious drug references in the titles, Gonzo and Cool Turkey hit number 10 on the Rhythm and Blues charts and number 43 on the pop charts. Booker went out on the road in support of the single. When he returned, the recordings following, such as Tubby Part 1 and Smaxy, were not nearly as successful. Booker split from Don Roby in 1962 and returned to New Orleans. For the next few years, Booker did session work with Lloyd Price and Fenton Robinson, traveled with B.B. King and Little Richard, and played organ at the Dewdrop. In addition, his drug addiction, which had started in the late 50s, worsened. Booker, the master of drugs. You can even DJ some people. Booker, the drug kingpin. See, man, the most funnest, hilarious things you ever gonna hear about Booker is dealing with drugs. See, man, look. Look, they had the Vice Squad. Look, this is the funniest thing. Back in the days, the Vice Squad, they knew Booker by his, his name. And they walk up, they say, hey, James, you got any dope on you? And, and Booker would reply some crazy stuff like this. Stone hitter. He said, look, if y'all have come 15 minutes early, you'd have caught all the dope. I just shot it all up in my arm a few minutes ago. And, and look, everybody around Booker be breaking out in hives and stuff because they're scared to death. Or Booker didn't pay that no mind. Look, if y'all have come 15 million, you'd have cut all the dope in the world. I just shot it up in my arm. It's gone. And <laughs> how y'all deal with that? <laughs> See, man, Booker was tying up in the in the bathroom one time and told me, he said, Earl, you see what I'm doing? Don't you never try this. I said, what you talking about? He said, I'm shooting some dope. Don't ever try this. You'll be a dead man. Book him. 
I don't know who actually turned him out, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I would guess that it happened somewhere around the Dewdrop, because <laughs> there's all kinds of shady characters going in and out of your Dewdrop all the time. Hustlers, pimps, gangsters, <laughs> whores. Ernest Johnson. What I know about James Booker was our relationship with drugs. I was a heroin addict, and he was a heroin addict, and we met that way. Uh, scoring drugs together. This was in the early 60s. The times I saw Jan Booker play, and, and most of those times, I mean, he was full of it. I never saw him to the point where he didn't know what he was doing. Well, during the, the years that I knew him, when he was the most upbeat and happy to a lucky, were the years that he was, he was sprung out during all that time. His playing was, you know, magnificent. So it seems that it, I mean, it, did, it didn't affect his playing uh, negatively in any way. And I guess the, the negative effect it had on his life was the negative effect that it, being addicted would have, you know, has on everyone. One of the nights at the Dewdrop, where he's, he's playing the organ and just really wailing and playing away and the way I was standing was in front of the organ, but going to the side of the organ, and he calls me. And when I look on the keys, in between all the black keys, he's got joints lined up <laughs> in there. And then at the end, a syringe <laughs> you know, sitting on the, the organ keys, and he's playing, and, then, and he's got a joint lit, you know, and he's smoking, and he's playing and, uh, playing and laughing and singing. Saxophonist and producer for AFO Records, Harold Batiste. I think he did things that were damaging to himself, and I think he lived in such a way that didn't really respect the talent that people thought he had. I mean, he was just another cat who was very talented, who was amazingly talented on the piano. Not only talented, but had a unique a sound. He had a touch more than a sound, it was a touch, and that touch was on the piano also, the way he could do certain things that would just sort of make the piano or the keyboard have qualities that wind instruments have or violins have, you know, could make notes blend together in a very, like, bending way. And when he sang, when he's playing, he seemed to be at one with that, with, at one with that. So that was James Booker, and I think that's what made him be unique. Most people don't know Booker this, in this manner, that he was uh, one of the greatest organ players you're going to ever hear. You know, his, his foot touching the control on the keyboard of the organ was just like his left hand, and I think it was magnificent. <laughs> In 1963, Booker not only toured with Lionel Hampton, but his organ skill was showcased in sessions with Lloyd Price. Here he is featured on Soulful Waltz from Lloyd Price's album, This Is My Band.
was a really great piano player. He knew how to comp, he knew how to accompany, and he could really play anything. Uh, it didn't matter what the song was, what kind of feeling there was to it. Everyone would know with total confidence that Booker was going to take care of business on it. At the end of 1965 and into 1966, tragedy struck James. First his mother, and then his sister died. James had been very close to both of them. Charles Neville and James's niece, Sheila, explain. Yeah, the, uh, the, the deaths of the members of this family seem to have a real deep effect on them. I wrote this song in memory of my dear mother. The name of this song is Aura. mother died of, of heart failure and complications. And six months later, my grandmother died. So he lost two very, you know, the main people left in his life, actually, the closest to him, because he and my mother were close, because it was just the two of them. Then they had their music that they shared as well. But uh, there was a, a bond between the two of them, and, and they, they played and sang a lot together. I remember as a kid, you know, in my grandmother's living room, her singing and him playing, how he would say, Betty, that's, that's not how that goes. This is how it goes like this, you know. So they teased back and forth. My grandmother died later, six six months or so of, uh, of breast cancer. Uncle J.C. played for the funeral, uh, which, you know, was amazing. And I can remember sitting on the front row and Uncle J.C. going up to play the piano and singing a song. I don't remember what that song was, of course. I just remember a whole lot of emotion in that church. And I do remember an instance where he did stop at a point where he just seemed to be really pretty full. I would think it had a great effect on him because his father died when he was a child, so, you know, he did have his mother when he grew up, who was, you know, supporting of him in his music, and to lose his sister, you know, who he loved and was his only sibling, and then turn around and then lose the mother, it had to have effect on him, you know. Being the loving and sensitive person I knew he was on the inside, it had to have a deep effect on him, because he probably felt pretty alone, because my aunt being, you know, who raised him was all he had left, actually. Now's the time for station identification. Sometimes 
Walker continued touring and doing sessions in the mid-1960s. The luminaries he played with included Ray Charles and Aretha Franklin. About 1967, he moved to New York City to play music with a growing group of transplanted New Orleans performers who included saxophonist Fred Kemp and Charles Neville. Charles Neville and I were sharing an apartment in New York. Booker used to come by sometime and we would all practice. Then Booker and I played with a guy named Melvin Lasty in New York. We did some gigs. And Melvin was also playing with King Curtis at the time. And then he got me to gig with King Curtis and Booker was in that band also. And then Booker and I played with Lloyd Price's band in New York before that. Together there was a big New Orleans community in Harlem. And we all, you know, managed to find each other. He toured with a lot of different bands. I think it was during that time. I remember him playing with Aretha Franklin. I remember him playing with Ray Charles. I remember him playing with all in all kinds of bands. Uh, and that's what he was doing. And he'd go on tour. He was recording with different bands, you know, with different artists as well. And he was playing gigs. I think he really loved New York. He, we. We lit, hung out in Harlem, and he really liked it. <laughs> we talked to him on the phone if he was in New York or wherever, you know, working with different people, and we'd hear these different names of people we knew. He was working with Aretha Franklin, you know. That was exciting to us when we were kids because she was so popular, you know, in those years. And Lionel Hampton's name and just names that we would hear on television or know of through listening to the radio or whatever. In 1968, Booker held the piano chair on Fats Domino's successful comeback album, Fats is Back. Booker is pounding the ivories here on I'm Ready. Having had his fill of New York, James came back to New Orleans in 1969. His old habits continued, and he got busted in 1970 in front of the Dewdrop Inn, 
when the police observed him taking a vial of white powder from his jacket. He was sentenced to two years at the Louisiana State Penitentiary in Angola for possession of heroin. His friend Ernest Johnson was also incarcerated there at that point. And I was in a parish prison. I was sentenced to some years in Angola. Went to the penitentiary, come back on a court audit. It must have been 70 when I met James Booker there. He did have a job in the library. And I think he taught some inmates to read. Well, in the 60s and in the early 70s, most guys in Angola was illiterate. They couldn't read and write. I mean, and they, would have, they would have one or two guys who could read and write, and they would do all the paperwork for all the inmates, like write letters to their people and all that. And if memory and all fail me, Booker did a lot of that, I think. He cared about people. He did care about people. I never seen him let what he do set him apart. At one time or another, yes, yes, he, he played music. I do remember the guys giving him a lot of respect in that area. There was a band there, so, you know, he got to play. And he became a legend there. Yeah, there were times when we had a really great band. We had some good guys up there. <laughs> Bunny Matthews. One uh, very interesting aspect of Angola is that... Um, he learned yoga, and he uh, became a yoga teacher and was teaching other inmates yoga. And uh, one day he was in a cell standing upside down on his head, and the guard came by and said, what are you doing, Booker? And Booker said, I'm doing time standing on my head. <laughs> and so I guess he became a, a, a yoga teacher, a guru. I mean, he knew a lot of stuff like that about Eastern religion, all, all kind of arcane uh, information he was privy to. talked about um, being in jail. He felt that this, the, some kind of metallic substance came into the bars and got into your body and, and screwed you up for life, really. And that could be psychological as well, you know, but he felt whatever substance that was in those bars would just ooze into your body and he would always feel really sick there. He said, you can't describe the feeling when you wake up and you're in jail, so. I said something to Booker one time. 
I said, Booker, you know I've been on you a long time. I said, you got bad nerves. And, and he replied to me in a jovial mouth, you just, you just realized I have bad nerves. I've been at bad nerves. What do you think I'm on all these pills? So I said, with the pills you're on, who prescribed them? You're the doctor. New Orleans rhythm and blues singer, Mr. Ernie Cato. Book get off the piano and got fire jumping off it. Completely fire. You know, just one of them things. Hey! Sometimes I live way out in the country right now. Sometimes, sometimes. Booker was a little uneasy about going into the studio in general, but for the six months prior to the recording sessions, John Parsons and I had suggested that he work with a group at the Maple Leaf, and the group became Johnny Vidakovich on drums, Red Tyler on tenor sax, and James Singleton on bass. I was managing the Maple Leaf Bar as an owner there. I remember we booked him after the jazz festival, and the, f the first night I remember meeting him, uh, he played there at the Maple Leaf one night. And I came up to the stage and introduced myself to him, and he said, he asked me if I had a cigarette, and I said, no, I don't smoke. He said, God damn it, I would have to get me a Baptist bar owner. <laughs> he played the piano like he had four or five hands, for one thing. He would go overseas, you know, to Germany or wherever, and, Anywhere overseas, and he was like the piano prince, you know, they, they respected him and had a royal carpet rolled out for him, you know. It was a trying experience working with Booker in the studio. It goes to show that a lot of creative people, you just can't push a button or book a time or create some sort of method and expect them to kind of fit into this. Booker used to joke about when he came on a stage, if he really wanted to turn out the crowd, he would do closers for openers. He would just come burning from the first instant and take off and just see where he landed. He was usually that way always.
During part two of James Carroll Booker III, The Life, Music, and Mystique of the Bayou Maharaja, we'll follow Booker's life through the 1970s and 80s. We'll hear about his European tours, the Junko Partner and Classified recordings, and his residencies at the Toulouse Theater and the Maple Leaf Bar in New Orleans. Also included will be an analysis of his piano style from Booker scholar Joshua Paxton. This has been David Cunion for WWOZ FM New Orleans. Thank you very much. I want to thank you also for coming out. Stick around. Best is yet to come. This program has been supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Louisiana State Arts Council, and the Louisiana Division of the Arts, Office of Cultural Development, Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. A grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and a generous grant from the Hennessy Foundation. Hello, and welcome to part two of James Carroll Booker III, The Life, Music, and Mystique of the Bayou Maharaja, produced by David Cunion for WWOZ-FM New Orleans. James Booker was the best pianist in New Orleans during his lifetime, as well as a sensitive and volatile personality. During part one, we followed his life from his days as a classically trained child prodigy, through his early singles recorded for Duke and Imperial Records, and his travels as a sideman for Shirley and Lee and Aretha Franklin. When we left off, James had just gotten out of Angola State Penitentiary in Louisiana, where he had been serving a sentence for a drug possession charge. Upon his release in December 1970, he went to Los Angeles to play on more sessions. While in Los Angeles, Booker picked up work on sessions with the Doobie Brothers, Jerry Garcia, and Ringo Starr. He played on Ringo's photograph album. These dates led to a dramatic change in Booker's life, the loss of his left eye. Bunny Matthews. The story I heard that he was um, doing session work for Ringo Starr in California and was complaining about the money he was getting. And some of the stories I've heard was he got paid, but he kept annoying him for more money and he was blowing the money on drugs. Somebody sent some guys to beat him up and they beat him up so badly he lost his eye. So I, I think that's the true story. That's what I've heard several times from different sources. Booker, in typical fashion, told many explanations for it. Earl King recalls how Booker explained it to him. He got beat up. While they were beating him up, they told him, hey, this is for Ringo. That's how he knew what it was about. So when he went to the hospital, they had to remove his eye. That's how bad he was beat up. So that's why he put the star on the patch. Ringo Starr, that's why he put that down there. In Los Angeles, Booker also worked with Dr. John, playing organ and piano. At one point, he recorded an album's worth of material with Dr. John's band. Here's one tune from those recordings, Stormy Monday. saxophonist Red Tyler. He said that one time he was on the bandstand uh, playing and they were playing in the theater and they looked for Booker and he had gone to the pipe organ, which is an instrument that you hit the keys and then you hear the sound later. 
and he said it was no problem for Booker. He played in the same meter with the band, even though playing the organ, you hit the keys and then you hear the sound later, and say it was no problem for him. So that was pretty, pretty good, I think. By 1975, James had settled back in New Orleans, playing gigs at clubs like Rosie's, Lou and Charlie's, the Dream Palace, the Toulouse Cafe, and the 501 Club, which later became Tipitina's. He also got a handle on his drug abuse and his business affairs. The Sherrick brothers knew him at that time. Rick became his lawyer, and Jim his drummer and friend. When I met him, he was, I don't want to use the word sane, but he was really into doing things properly. I mean, he had, had reached a point in his life where he took his music seriously. He uh, definitely tried to do everything right. Uh, it wasn't like he was in the later days, where he became very erratic again. Booker had previously had a reputation of not showing up, showing up two hours late, and it hurt him for a long time. But about that time, about late 75, is when he changed his ways, so to speak, and started showing up a half hour early at gigs and things, and uh, people started appreciating him a little bit more because he became more reliable. He always wanted to help himself. He always had the thought and, and the intention to do better for himself. You know, he felt like the, the, that the heroin was killing him, you know. He had spent time in jail as a result of it. He was real proud of his relationship with the U-Turb Center. It was a, uh, a work help type of halfway house type of thing. And, you know, he was really involved in it. Uh, he used to spend a lot of time there and there again, play piano a lot there and, and whatnot. He was really trying real hard. He was uh, intelligent. He was witty. He was uh, a real caring type of person. I'll give you an example, my mother and Booker share the same birthday, uh, December 17th. Every year, Booker called my mother to wish her happy birthday. He, he needed somebody to talk to. He was a really lonely person. And if he found you to be someone that he could talk to, then you know, he would want to spend you know, lengthy time. Sometimes it was a burdensome thing to be a friend of James Booker because uh, I mean, you know, the stories are, are bizarre. I caught him in what I think is one of his most pleasant times. I learned a tremendous amount from the guy. He was very coherent to me. But he was a very, very sincere, you know, he, he was a deeply emotional person. Reggie Scanlon was the bass player for Professor Longhair, as well as James Booker. He was a great guy to hang out with, and he had stories, and he was, he was hilarious. But then, on the other hand, you could, and, and then in the drop of a hat, literally, he would go from that to, like, somebody who was just totally... Uh, you were unable to deal with. He'd be paranoid, or he'd be, you know, he'd be afraid the Secret Service was after him, or the FBI, or you know, just any of a myriad, you know, groups of people or, or individuals that he was convinced was out were out to get him. When he got like that, it was kind of hard to be around him, and also that was the downside to playing with him because that could happen on a gig also. Russell Rock was the manager of the Toulouse Theater and a friend of Booker's. Booker had those extremes of personality that took you off into stream of consciousness thinking and brilliant relations and absurdities and inanities and, and violent emotions and peaceful emotions and hysterical emotions all at the same time that you, you were completely live when you were with Booker. There was no doubt about it. You never knew what was going to happen in the midst of a song he could start screaming and wailing and walk out. He had a sunny side of the street personality that had overcome so much pain that when Booker was high, it was like the world was high. He was just overwhelmingly, magnetically happy. And then when he went into depression, he went into dark night fallen, as dark as anything you could imagine, suicidally dark, for which he needed to drink enormous amounts to deaden the pain or do heroin and do other things. But 
he would try to fight from being depression into, into being very happy. And, and because he was so magnetic and because he was so good on the piano, he created a, a lot of attraction around him. And, but all of it was, you could, you could just see and feel and know that this was a profoundly sensitive artist, a, a beautiful guy. There's no one in the New Orleans music community that you, you, you could compare to uh, that, that was so explosively both brilliant on his instrument and unpredictable in his emotions, who could do things that, you know, he wouldn't even know what he was doing. Uh, so, so as a consequence, it was very exciting to hear him. It was a very emotional experience. It took you out of wherever you were and placed you very much present, and which is of course, the reason that you go to live entertainment, it was, it was uh, a, a thrilling experience. Ow! Well, professor and Booker's good friend, Thorny Penfield. I would describe his music, I suppose, as being characterized by metaphysical wit. Tons of things going on simultaneously. Many, many layers. Um, many levels of feeling, I think, going on at the same time. James had an incredible capacity to generate beauty even in the midst of his worst chaos, he would strike chords that could bring tears to your eyes. nothing else he didn't need no other instruments that's why he played a lot of gigs by himself because he played the, the drums the bass the guitar the, you know everything he was a band you know then he could sing you know Aaron Neville he could play anything from the blues to Tchaikovsky or Beethoven or whoever he could play all of them at once and he'd do it I'm gonna shoot a little cocaine a cocaine baby on the side right now wow and there's a little taste of heaven, Lord, before I die. I, I, I. Way down the road, down the road, well, the world come on down. Cool, pop, now, pop, pop, now, pop, now, pop, pop. Knock out, knock out, knock out, load it. Was a load it, was load it, I was loaded. I like to get loaded, loaded.
Booker's appearance at the 1975 New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival brought him to the attention of a promoter who set Booker up for tours in Europe. There he was extremely well received, but some of his experiences were less than optimal. Aaron Neville, Jim Sherrick, and then Bunny Matthews explain of Booker's travels through Europe. He would go overseas, you know, to Germany or wherever, and anywhere overseas, and he was like the piano prince, you know, they, they respected him, and, you know, he had, you know, he had a royal carpet rolled out for him. Then he'd go to, to Europe. He was the piano prince of New Orleans, and he was really particularly well respected at performance. When he got up to perform, his virtuosity was apparent to the European audience, and, and you know, he relished that treatment, that acknowledgement that he got. Near the end of his life, he had these bad experiences, I know, in, um, in Europe and stuff with promoters, and this one guy took all of his clothes and locked him in a hotel room and kind of left him there stranded and, and uh, kind of held Booker prisoner. From what I knew, uh, Booker would go there and they'd get him all the drugs he wanted, you know, and get him really loaded. He'd be happy, but they were just, to me, kind of taking advantage of this poor man. You know, they knew his weakness and knew that they could uh, keep him high and he wouldn't entertain him. But I don't think he made any great deal of money off of this. The guy in Germany, Earl King, was booking, you know, Booker over there, and he didn't realize that Booker not only read German, but he even speak German. Booker read the contracts and saw what the guy was booking him over there for. He told Booker one price. So when Booker Renee, the guy locked Booker's clothes up in his house, where Booker couldn't get no clothes to perform with and, and stuff like that. Yeah, oh, he's a big man. Then Booker wound up meeting some baron over there and staying at his house. Get yourself a school and school and Doug Jackson was the sound man at the Toulouse Theater when Booker played there. The man had an incredible technique and used it to the utmost, which I think is sort of in the tradition of what I understand to be the what any good pianist from New Orleans would do. I mean, going way back. I mean, when you listen to uh, Jelly Roll Morton on the Library of Congress recordings, pianists in New Orleans were coming up, you know, had to know a wide repertoire to be, to compete for jobs, you know. And especially, you know, if he is to believe about the pianists in the Houses of Prostitution in Storyville, you know, they had to know, I think he said in his interviews, they had to know the, everything from the latest pop tune to the latest French opera and as well as all kinds of classical music as well as the pop tunes and the you know whatever was popular and so I think that uh, Booker really was maybe one of the last pianists to uh, come out of that tradition Upon returning to New Orleans Booker went into Sea Saint Studios and recorded the album Junko Partner for Island Records. This solo piano record, produced by Joe Boyd, contains the definitive versions of several Booker favorites, including his signature tune, Junko Partner. Here, Joe Boyd talks about recording this album. Down the road, down the road, whoa, come on Junko Partner right now. Down the road, down the road, oh, come a Junko Partner. Recording uh, Junko Partner in, in New Orleans was just a great experience. 
you know, he was used to doing records with a rhythm section and trying to make a, a hit and, and all that kind of thing. And we just wanted him to be himself, play a wide range of things. And he, he found this kind of, at first, rather strange. And then once he warmed to the idea, he kind of got quite enthusiastic about it. But he did view us as slightly odd or eccentric for wanting to do this kind of a record. But then he's, he made his one real demand, and his one real demand was that he had to have a candelabra. And he kept talking about himself as the Black Liberace. And so we dimmed the lights in the studio, and he just basically held court for two days. I remember Earl King came by and cheered him on. And uh, it, was, it was just, um, and I think by the end of it, he'd kind of gotten to really enjoy it and really saw the value of it. And then, of course, was very frustrated because it took us a long time to actually get the record released. And even then, it wasn't really released in America. I would buy my goodbye, Nana Ron Angola, and go a nice weed farm till 1992. 92. I want a whiskey. I want my lover, lover, when I'm lonely right now. And a little hair on, a little hair on, just before I die. And a little cocaine, a cocaine, baby, on the side, on the side. I want a cocaine, a cocaine. Now's the time for station identification. Bunny Matthews. I remember a show on WNOE Radio, which is now a country station, but they were a rock station at one time. One summer in the 70s, they did live radio broadcast. And so Booker went on there and did a really great performance. But most of the performance have also involved uh, pro-drug statements, statements about uh, America's policy towards Turkey, you know, vis-a-vis -vis heroin. And uh, he lambasted against different judges in New Orleans and sent out personal messages to Harry Connick over the radio waves, you know. And then he, I remember him voicing this concern that he was going to be busted after the radio show and that all the white boys in the audience better get their coins together to get him out of jail. And That's right. They're doing one year. And some of them, they got so many charges on them that one year ain't enough. If they've been there for shooting dope,
Booker's manager, John Parsons. I was managing the Maple Leaf Bar as an owner there. I remember we booked him after the jazz festival, and the, f- the first night I remember meeting him, uh, he played there at the Maple Leaf one night, and I came up to the stage and introduced myself to him, and he said, he asked me if I had a cigarette, and I said, no, I don't smoke. He said, God damn it, I would have to get me a Baptist bar owner. <laughs> and uh, that pretty much set the tone for the next seven or so years that he played there as a regular gig, on first on Tuesday nights and then on Monday nights. It was just one thing after another with James. After I knew him about three or four years, uh, some of his friends and his lawyers suggested I try managing James, and I said, well, I'll take a crack at it. And he was a difficult person to work with. Parsons started recording James through his time at the Maple Leaf until James's death in 1983. These tapes were posthumously released by Rounder Records in 1993 as Spider on the Keys and Resurrection of the Bayou Maharaja. Here's another one of Booker's signature pieces on the sunny side of the street. James got another steady gig that lasted for several years. Russell Rock, owner of the Toulouse Theater, explains. James was, of course, very well known in New Orleans when I first bought the Toulouse Theater in 1977 and immediately wanted to have a lobby pianist. And somewhere in 1977, I had heard Booker and met Booker, and so I invited him into the theater and in short order, he became the lobby pianist sometime, maybe at the end of 77 or early 78. We had a theater, and then we had a lobby, and I put a bar into the lobby and a piano in the lobby. And in that era, uh, the vaudeville show of the 1920s, One Mo Time, was introduced at the Toulouse Theater and ultimately ran for six years. And for that entire length of time, James would play before the show, the intermission, and usually after the show, in the lobby for the 250 people who were coming and going every day. It was part of the experience of One More Time, was being introduced to brilliance as you walked into that lobby. The Toulouse Theater and the Maple Leaf Bar became Booker's steady gigs. A sort of musicians played with him there and at his other shows. Jim Sherrick talks about what it was like to play music with him. He gave me more live playing experience than anybody because Booker would play anything. You never knew when he started the intro of a song what song it was going to end up being and whether or not you'd ever rehearsed it or ever even heard it before. So that part was tremendously awakening to me. And I can remember just sitting looking at him, man, he'd have his head back and he was just like in another world. curator of the Hogan Jazz Archive at Tulane University, and Booker's drummer, Dr. Bruce Rayburn. We became known as James Booker and the Angola Candidates, and he seemed to like the improvisational aspect, because even though we rehearsed a lot, Booker was one of these individuals who could take a single tune and turn it into a medley, and so you had to be ready all the time, so that's part of what made it so interesting, is that Booker could take any single tune and next thing you knew, you were in uncharted waters. No matter how many times you had studied this tune, he might find something different to do with it. Uh, His singing was so soulful. It could be comic, it could be tragic. He just, he could bounce from one to the other. Some of the things I liked best that he did were the ballads. I mean, his singing, Please Send Me Someone to Love. His vocals on that just could rip your heart out, stomp on it, shove it back down your throat, and it's pumping again. 
he really knows how to evoke feeling. On Please Send Me Someone to Love, the sincerity of his rendition really knocked me out. I mean, it's like whatever pain that man was carrying around, a vehicle like that was perfect for him to bring it all out and maybe achieve some sort of catharsis. I don't know. Heaven, please send to all mankind understanding and peace of mind. But if it's not asking too much, please send me someone to love. Someone to love Show the world how To get along Peace will enter When hate is gone Well, but if it's not asking too much So my answer is always, it's always the same. Unless man bring it in to this horrible sin, hate is gonna put the world in a flame. Well, what a shame just because I'm. In misery, I don't beg for no sympathy. Reggie Scanlon. He was totally stream of consciousness. What anything that he could that he thought in his head, without it, him even really consciously thinking about how he was going to do it, he could do it. I mean, it, he would it would enter his brain and come out of his hands like that. He could play Mozart piece in the middle of the jungle part or something, and he had the ability to make that seem like it was just a logical transition. Mixed up so many different styles. He was the master of the medley. I don't think I've ever heard anybody who would go from Chopin and then go into the Godfather theme and then go into Babyface and then go into a rock and roll medley, sound like Little Richard doing Tutti Frutti or uh, Fats Domino tunes like uh, Let the Four Winds Blow and. Uh, it was just an amazing experience that you see him fly across the ivories. I don't beg for no sympathy, but if it's not asking too much, please send me someone to love.
His moods changed from day to day. Sometimes he'd be very up, and sometimes, to me anyway, he seemed like he'd be down. I'd walk into the theater and he'd say, well, how, how are you doing, James? And he'd go, almost. And that's all he'd say to me is like, how do you feel today? And almost. John Parsons. One of the things he used to do was go to the charity hospital. And uh, he would check into the mental ward. They would let him in up there and let him sober up for a, a, a few weeks every now and then he would just check it up there and then he would play the piano for the doctors up there and it, it worked out real good they treated him real good up there there was one or two occasions when he was having so many problems being on the street just trying to function i mean his mind was so chaotic it was so speeded up it was like a double speed freak that uh, I even persuaded him. I said, James, isn't it time for you to go to cool out for a couple of weeks and go and so forth? And he said, yes, and he, once, and he once voluntarily walked in with me. Ah, look at all the lonely people. I look at all the lonely people out there, people out there. As the 1970s wound to a close, people noticed a change had come over James Booker. Charles Neville gives his thoughts. Last few years that I knew him and played with him, he was nearly almost totally different, totally negative, and you know, very unhappy and not really interested in anything. He never actually told me, you know, sit down and tell me, well, this is why it's like this. There were things that he said from time to time that indicated that he felt he was being persecuted in some way by someone, and that also he had suffered really a disproportionate misfortune. Just that his luck was bad, bad things happened to him that he didn't deserve. Owner of the Louisiana Music Factory and Booker's one-time roommate, Jerry Brock. But he was, he was a very frustrated, tortured soul at the end of his life. He didn't trust anybody. He felt everybody was basically ripping him off. He was very paranoid about touring and about the CIA and felt because he had such genius and talent that you know, somebody must be watching him for some reason or another, other than just to perform a piano. He was very paranoid towards the end of his life. He always uh, felt that the CIA was following him. Writing the words of a sermon that no one will hear. There was a, I, I imagine, there was something nagging at him. And I didn't know what it was. I, I could never pinpoint, you know, what was nagging at him, really. Such a such a great musician and uh, like you know I would say something like sit down, sit down and everyone one end come out the other man that's too much talent in one package So you get a little glimpse of something like that every now and then. Producer Scott Billington. That lets you know that behind this hard-to-read exterior and the unpredictability of his personality or problems brought on by substance abuse, that there was this person in there who was really struggling with himself. To tell my troubles to My baby's gone away and left me And I just don't really know just what to do Because that black night is falling Keeps on falling Jim Sharrick. Easy for me to understand, not being a virtuoso on my instrument, how frustrating it must have been for the guy. Because, you know, we'd play clubs here, and, you know, there'd be tons of people, and everybody, you know, Booker would be playing this brilliant stuff, and everybody would be talking through the same old stuff.
stuff that's always going on. Aaron Neville. When he got back to New Orleans, he was just taking for granted, oh, that's Booker. You could go see him at the Maple Leaf. They might have six people in there. But he'd be playing his heart out for him. He'd be giving him, like he's playing for a million-dollar gig. He loved New Orleans. Joel Neville. Well, it seemed like he always, he always needed to belong to somebody. And he seemed like he didn't have that somebody to hold him. And that's what I kind of have a kind of secretness about him because I used to hug him all the time and let him know that he belonged to us. That's the kind of comfort I think I got and he got too. And we kind of loved him. In fact, you know, kind of loved him. We really loved him. And, uh, you know, he was just like, at that time it got to be a, a thing like he was just like a relative of mine. Now's the time for station identification. Booker's gig at the Maple Leaf led to his first recording session since 1976 for Rounder Records. Scott Billington, co-producer of the Rounder album Classified, recalls. For the six months prior to the recording sessions, John Parsons and I had suggested that he work with a group at the Maple Leaf. And the group became Johnny Vidakovich on drums, Red Tyler on tenor sax, and James Singleton on bass. And after six months, the group sounded really good. He had very definite ideas about what he wanted to do. About two weeks before the sessions, he ended up in the hospital. He had kind of a breakdown. I called Booker and talked to him there. He could, he could be funny sometimes. He'd say, oh, you know what I'd really, really like? I can't have it here. And I'd say, what's that, James? And he'd say, I'd like a lukewarm bath. <laughs> he did check out of the hospital, wanted to go ahead with the recording process. And we got down to the business of recording. The second day was rough. Booker became completely non-communicative. For a while, he wouldn't say anything, he wouldn't play. At one point, Red Tyler and I went and picked him up in the corner. He was kind of crouched down in the corner in fetal position. We carried him back to the piano and sat him down on the bench and said, Listen, man, play the piano. You, know, you got to play. We're going to cancel the session. So that second day in the studio was a total, total nightmare. So on the third day, I, was, uh, I decided I should go to the studio early to listen to the tapes. I got there about 9 o'clock. I think the, the session itself was called for noon to meet the engineer and Booker standing outside the door when I got there at 9 in the morning. I said, I want to play now. I want to play. I said, okay, that's great. Oh, and about the next hour, he played all of the solo piano material that was on the classified album. And I called the musicians and just said, get here as quick as you can. At some point, Booker asked me if he could be paid then. And I said, sure, Booker, I think you check. He went back out into the studio and started to play a little more and all of a sudden stopped the piano and said, what time does the bank close? Somebody said, uh, it's about three, Booker. And he got up, ran out the door, and that was the last anybody saw of him for several weeks. Drummer on the classified session, Johnny Vidakovich. Things like angel eyes or, uh, you know, that cut on there, that was like, I, even when it was going down in the studio, man, we did several takes of it. And every time we did a take, he would do a different harmonization. It was so intense, man, even though it's so slow and soulful. I mean, the spontaneous composing that was going down at the moment of that is magic.
classified sessions ended and the album was released in mid-1983. By this point, James Booker's life had taken another turn. He got a day job working for the Department of Economic Analysis in New Orleans City Hall. His supervisor and devoted fan, Lee Madare, tells about this period. I was working at City Hall. I was in the mayor's office as chief economist. And one day, uh, James called and said he wanted to speak to Mr. Madair. So I knew that something was up because he had never called me Mr. Madair. He had always called me, hey, you, or Lee, or her. And he had been in a charity, I think, drawing out. And it had been suggested to him that he should get a job, like a regular day job, uh, so that he would have a sort of a normal life. And he told me, that he had learned to uh, type and file in Angola and that he would like a job. And we had some clerk work that he was probably capable of doing. And James became a file clerk in the Office of Economic Analysis. The people there claimed that the files were never the same after James got there. The deal was that he would show up on time sober. He had to be there for 9 o'clock in the morning, and he couldn't be drunk. And he kept up his part of the bargain for just about a year. And then he was not able to keep his part of the deal anymore. He started showing up intoxicated. And so after a couple of months of that, I had to terminate him, and that was about two months before he died. For the last 50 odd minutes, you've heard many people talk about James Booker, his life, his personality, and his eccentricities. But what made him such a good pianist? What was it when his fingers touched the keys and played notes and chords to bring forth the beautiful music? Pianist Joshua Paxton has done extensive analysis of James Booker's music. Here are his comments. He has several different unique styles that he plays. One is the way that he plays stride piano which is unlike any other New Orleans pianist or any other pianist that I've ever heard in general. Most people, when they play stride, they'll usually hit a note or a chord in their left hand and then come up and hit a higher chord, something like this. What Booker would do is instead of just having the single note, he would have a, a sort of gadant rhythm going. But instead of just hitting, say, a single note and going down to another one like most pianists would do, he had a very strange way of voicing his chords. For instance, on Sunny Side of the Street, he plays it like this. What he's doing there is where most people would play, say, just a couple of notes. He's hitting two notes at once up here, and then two more down here. That is, first of all, very awkward to do with your fingers. It's not something that most pianists would come up with intuitively, and it gives it a very unique sound, which is why his stride doesn't sound like anyone else's. He had another bass pattern he did, which is based on a pretty common one, which goes like this. But since he had such a large hand span, he would throw in another note on top of that so that it went like this. Something like that. That gives it a much fuller sound so that when he's doing things way up high in the right hand, it sounds like a full orchestra. When he played a shuffle, he wouldn't just play a typical groove like this. But he'd add just one extra note. And would throw in these little walk-ups. Again, to push the groove ahead. So instead of this, you had this.
The Booker always needed that, uh, I guess you would consider that a mentor or a patron. He would have done real well to have a, a, you know, somebody that, that patronized him to the point where Booker didn't have to worry about the everyday things of life. Because this man was a genius. If you walked up on, uh, on him and he was drunk or, or loaded, you weren't going to think he was a genius. But if you ever had the occasion to sit down face to face with the guy and really understand him, it was very apparent that the man was a genius. And uh, genius is a very, very difficult state of mind to handle your, you know, to, to continue some sense of sanity because it's, uh, it's just, a, just a hard road. And Booker felt every bump of that hard road, you know. I think too many people judge him as that crazy person that he was intelligent enough to pull off that thing. Sure, it was aided by drugs and alcohol on occasion. But when you start acting like a crazy man, people start thinking you're a crazy man. And he liked to play that role. Booker's boyhood friend, Art Neville. He wasn't crazy. I think that was a way of him getting over to him. He's whatever was happening in life. He just said it, told it like it was. If that's what he thought was happening. And like I say, if he'd have been really, he was, he was very, he's a very, very intelligent person. Very intelligent man. And he would say, like I say, he would say things he didn't care. I mean, what you gonna do it? Two nights before he died, I had breakfast with him. And I went out there, I just happened to be around him. We said, what you doing? I told him, I'm going to get breakfast, said, come on. And I knew he was dying right then, the way he was talking, what he was asking me, you know, about his music. He started questioning what he was doing and what he was telling me, the way he was talking to me. It was obvious that he wasn't going to be around too long. He had to give up, he was ready to rest. Fight had beat him up too bad. And then when everything is separated, your spiritual, your your, your emotional, your, your mental. And when all of that stuff is all segregated, it's torn apart. I mean, it's nothing you can do, man. You know, you had to give in. I mean, you got to submit at a point, at some point in your life. That's when you die. The story I heard of his death, that he had gotten into some bad cocaine. He was hanging out at some bars down on Orleans off of Claiborne down there. And uh, the cab driver dropped him off at the charity hospital where he was having an internal organ failure, maybe a heart attack, and they were wheeling him to the coronary room, and somebody created a disturbance. The guy who was wheeling him went to take care of this other guy, and some other orderly came along and saw his eye missing, so they wheeled him to see an eye doctor while he was having a heart attack. And uh, that's the story I got. Joelle Neville was working as a nurse in Charity Hospital at the time. Like the day he died. Now that's the day I'd see him come in the hospital every time he'd come. That particular day I didn't go to work. So I missed him in the chair sitting there dying, waiting for medical help. I would have passed him that day because I had to pass in that area to go to lunch. And that was during the time like he died right around 2 or 3 o'clock and uh, he had been sitting in this chair all day. So I didn't go to work that day, so that's the way fate had it to be. I missed it. Oh, darling, you don't think of James Carroll Booker III died at Charity Hospital in New Orleans on Tuesday, November 8, 1983. The official cause of death was intestinal bleeding and heart and lung failure. He was interred at Providence Memorial Park in Metairie, outside New Orleans. His presence in music is still greatly missed to this day by young and old. that he was as good as he was and and people just didn't appreciate what he was doing. I remember one incident he did in the do drop, he was in there playing. Like the people back like his background music was got up from fancy people ain't paying no attention when I'm playing, closed the piano and left and went home, man. <laughs> I mean in the middle of the gig, you know. People just didn't know, man. It's just how it is. That's just the way things are. A lot of our blessings, we tend to ignore them, you know. I just don't see them, you know. But one thing, he had a God-given talent, you know, and that's something that nobody couldn't take away from him, regardless of what else was happening.
That's the kind of person that Booker was. Booker is awesome, man. Booker was not real, he was not human with us on the planet Earth. Nah, nah, yeah. Booker was the quintessential New Orleans pianist. They call him the piano prince, that's for real. This program was produced, engineered, and edited by David Cunion in association with WWOZ-FM New Orleans in 1996. The producer would like to thank everyone who gave their valuable time to be interviewed for this project, and especially Scott Billington, Jerry Brock, Billy Dell, Patricia Gorman, Jeff Hanish, Pat Jolly, Lee Madair, Maria at Wilkins Management, Bunny Matthews, Tom McDermott, Sharon McKenna, Joel and Aaron Neville, Thorny Penfield, Steve Rath, Kathy Sebastian, Jim Sherrick, John Sinclair, Emily Snyder, Portia Williams, David Friedman, Michael Klein, Damon Jacob, and Maurice Dejan at WWOZ, and of course, the enduring spirit of James Carroll Booker III. Danke schön. Danke schön. <laughs> this program is funded under a grant from the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. The opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily represent the views of either the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. This project was also supported by a generous grant from the Hennessy Foundation. In addition, this program was supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Louisiana State Arts Council, and the Louisiana Division of the Arts, Office of Cultural Development, Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. We used to have this recording of the Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto on the Maple Leaf Jukebox. It was, it was won by uh, Russian piano player Sviatoslav Richter, and uh, I used to play it a lot while James was on a break, and I'd tell James, that's a hard act to follow. And he would say, look, that man can't play Junko Partner. Ha, 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 ha.